Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Hannah Arendt provided a course on the history of political theory back in 1955. And she typed out her lectures, and these are available in the, the archives. And the conclusion to that particular course has a very interesting discussion that touches on the point and purposes of philosophy and its relation with politics and political conditions, as well as with other things. And she uses this master metaphor of the desert sandstorms, and oases. Philosophy turns out to be one of the oases, and the life in which we live, which is a life in which we have to engage in what, what she, very broadly speaking, called politics, is the desert, the desert of modern life. So within just three pages, she sets out a very interesting set of considerations for us that help us understand what philosophy might be good for in ways that go quite different from, from other uh, construals of philosophy. So she tells us um, that the, the desert is the world under whose conditions we move, and she calls this the withering away of the in-between, the growth of worldlessness, the spread of the desert, and she says that the desert was actually first recognized by Friedrich Nietzsche, and if you remember your Nietzsche, you know that he was very concerned about uh, the development of modern culture, which he saw as uh, largely modes of, of degeneracy and uh, reaching a certain time period in which nihilism would become the main problem of our, our era. He thought that was actually going to be the main issue of the 20th century, and he may have, in fact, been correct. And he thought that people would find all sorts of ways to try to avoid this, but none of them would be ultimately successful. And Arendt says that this desert was first recognized by Nietzsche. But it was also Nietzsche, she says, who made the decisive first mistake in diagnosing and describing it. And then she says that it's not just Nietzsche. Everybody else following him has been seeing this uh, the same way as well. What is this fundamental mistake? He believed the desert is in ourselves. And so he says, she says, it was precisely in this diagnostic he revealed himself as one of the first conscious inhabitants of the desert. So if the desert is not simply in ourselves, uh, with, then the meaning would be we have to cultivate something in ourselves, but rather it's out there in the way in which we do live with each other or fail to live with each other, then we have to have different ways of approaching it. And she tells us that the modern psychologists have essentially followed Nietzsche in this. She says, that um, we have a psychology of the desert and by the same token, the victim of the most terrible illusion in the desert is that we begin to think that there's something wrong with us because we cannot live under the conditions of desert life. So modern psychology, and by this, I, I think she means not primarily experimental psychology, but psychotherapy and all of the theory that accompanies it. She says that, when psychology is trying to help people, what it's really trying to help them do is to adjust themselves to a world that doesn't have to be the way that it is and is really screwed up and is 
lacking not just in meaning, but in what would sustain us. A world in which we're forced into the wasteland, into the desert. So people learn to, to deal with that, learn to cope, learn strategies. And the deserts can be of many different kinds. You could picture the desert of consumerism as well. Uh, you know, in our own internet age where everything seems to be available, not just in terms of buying products on, say, Amazon or wherever else you want to go, but just in the sheer amount of information that's floating out there. And yet our young people and many of our old people lack the information literacy to be even minutely critical about the sources that they're deriving this information from. And we have, you know, problems with the the main sites that we're we're, uh, relying upon, all the big tech companies, even sites like Wikipedia, where we know that there's many things wrong with it. Um, These are all part of what she's calling the desert. And so psychology she says, tries to help us adjust to the conditions of desert life. This takes our only hope away. And what is this hope? It would be that, she says, we who are not of the desert, but who live in it, would be able to transform the desert into a human world. We would need to do that through action, which requires, as she says a little bit later, in this courage, And the psychology of the desert militates against it. Instead, it teaches us how to fit in better and to not expect quite so much. So she says that psychology makes everything topsy-turvy. Because we suffer under desert conditions, we're still human, we're still intact. The danger is that we become truly inhabitants of the desert and feel at home in it. We take that as the new normal. We shorten our horizons we shorten uh, our gaze towards the depths and now say, well, this is okay. Like that old meme that you see with a dog sitting in the room where everything is on fire saying to himself, this is all right. So that's what she takes that as, as doing. Then she talks about another type of danger. If one of the dangers in the desert is that of drying out, of, of becoming desiccated, another is of sandstorms. What are sandstorms in this case? She says that the desert is not always the quiet of the cemetery where, after all, everything is still possible, but whips up a movement of its own. What are these? Totalitarian movements whose danger lies precisely in the fact that they are so extremely well-adjusted to the conditions in the desert. Now, Arendt lived through totalitarianism. She saw what happened, not just within Nazi Germany, which she escaped from, fortunately, uh, because she was actually marked for extermination herself, but went on to do an entire study on the origins of totalitarianism that many people purchase and check out of the library but don't read in its fullness because it is so encyclopedic in its examination and so deep in its theoretical investigation. Totalitarian movements appeal to those who are within the desert because they provide some sort of ready-made meaning. They provide a mode of action. They provide excitement. They provide being alive. They allow you to indulge things that are otherwise recognizable as, as wrong. But people get into that. And all sorts of totalitarian and totalizing movements would do this. She says that they reckon with nothing else than the desert and therefore seem to be the most adequate political forms of desert life. And then she says, both psychology as the discipline of adjusted human life in the desert and totalitarian movements threaten the two faculties of the human being with which we may be able to patiently transform the desert rather than transforming just ourselves. The faculty of passion and the faculty of action. The faculty of action is doing something. Doing something not just only on our own, but with others who we have to, in some way, speak to in order that we can cooperate. But the faculty of passion is uh, involving what she calls here it, the virtue of endurance. She says, only those who can endure the passion of living under conditions of the desert 
can be trusted with summing up in themselves the courage which lies at the root of all action of becoming an active being. And indeed, living out the vita activa, the active life that she thought was so central. So those who lose themselves in totalitarian movements because that provides them with a ready-made identity and a course of action or anything along those lines, those who buy into the just adjust yourself to the conditions that exist, she's saying they're not the ones who should be transforming things because they're already okay with the desert as it is. Now, the sandstorms also, she says, threaten what we call oases. The oases in the desert without which none of us could endure it. She says, psychology tries to get us so accustomed to desert life, we shall no longer feel any need for oases. The sandstorms could swamp them. What are these oases? She tells us that they are the fields of life which exist independently or largely so from political conditions. So they're not reducible to, to that. And as a matter of fact, individuality and relations between individuals, personal relations, become incredibly important in this light. They're not supposed to be, as she says a little bit later, they're not supposed to be escapes. They're not supposed to be mere refuges for relaxation. You're not being taken out of the, the front lines to do some R&R &R hedonistically away from the front before being thrown back in, if we want to use that sort of metaphor. And she talks about the danger in, involved in, in these sorts of things. She says that um, oases are not relaxation. They're the life spending wells which enable us to live in the desert without becoming reconciled to it. Without becoming reconciled to it. So that we don't say, ah, desert, that's fine, because I'm going to get my fun over here. She says that there's an opposite danger. Escapism. To escape from the world of the desert, from politics into whatever it may be. Think about all the things that people use as escapes in the present. For example, gaming or endlessly watching YouTube videos, or just watching streaming content, and then entering into fandom that may, in fact, you know, have a nice little conflict here and there. Who's shipping who? And, you know, what representation is going on here? But, but it really all ends up being a kind of politics as a way of commodifying things, a way of just expressing your own individuality. It's essentially consumerism just in another way. An escapism could be the escapism of taking drugs and partying and, you know, th trying to not think about tomorrow. That's a form of escapism as well. The everything is crap, doom and gloom and sort of indulging oneself in that would also be escapism. She says that this is less dangerous and a more subtle form of ruining the oases than the sandstorms which threaten its existence. By escaping, she says, we carry the sand of the desert into the oases. Now, that's important when we think about what the oases actually are. So let's, let's take a look at the, the oases she talks about. She doesn't say that these are the only possibilities, but she names four of them as centrally important. And remember, when we're talking about this, we're not talking about just any old form of this. We're talking about what you might call the essence of it expressed in the individual or in the personal. So she, she says, um, here we go. These oases are all fields of life existing independently or largely so from political conditions. What went wrong is politics. That is, we, insofar as we exist in the plural and not what we can do and create as we exist in the singular. In, now she says, isolation like the artist. In solitude like the philosopher. In the inherently worldless relationship between man and man as it exists in love and sometimes in friendship. So she describes these a little bit. She says, friendship, when one heart reaches out directly to the other, or when in passion, now we're talking about love, the in-between, the world goes up in flames. 
So we have these, these four things that she's talking about. Art, and not just the production of art, but also the appreciation of art. The world of the desert is one in which art becomes mere commodity, mere background, or gets all sorts of prizes. It's essentially domesticated. The world of art would probably also include that of music as well. Then we have the world of philosophy. Does she mean philosophy in an academic sense? No. As a matter of fact, Arendt was very harsh towards academic philosophers. She talked about the fact that they tended to spend their time writing articles that nobody would read. And she was saying that back in the 1950s and 60s. No, she means philosophy in a very broad sense where philosophy actually intrudes into these other fields like art, but also politics and other areas as well, where it could inform a better psychology as well. Love, eros, desire, romantic relationships, sexual relationships. Those are between people. Those, of course, can become a matter of mere pleasure-seeking and escapism. That's where people drag the sand into the oases. But it can also be the source of an intimacy that is different than an intimacy of friendship, what the medievals called conjugal love which was consummated through actually doing it, right? Having sex and all the other things that go along with that. Friendship. Again, does she mean, oh, Facebook friends and everybody I call my acquaintances? No. She means a deep abiding connection between people who get to know each other and find something that they respond to in the other and who, using Aristotle's formula, Wish well to the other for the other's own sake. These provide us with oases. All of these are completely contingent. All of these could be destroyed by the sandstorms of totalitarian movements. All of them could have their wells dry up. All of them can have sand dragged into them and become unuse unusable because people are using them as modes of escape. But used rightly. They allow us to live in the desert and not be of the desert and allow us to think that we might be able to do something else with this desert. So she says that, this is towards the end of this discussion, the world is always a desert who needs those who are beginners to be started anew in it. There's never the right time for transforming it, but we will need these oases in order to do that. And she says, out of the conditions of desert, which started with the beginning of worldlessness in the modern age, grew the question, why is there something at all and not rather nothing? Out of the modern world condition where we are threatened not only with no thingness, nothingness, but with no buddiness, we may grow the question, why is there somebody at all and not rather nobody or the generic? This is about individuality and, and being particular, being single, but doing so in a way that connects us with a world that doesn't need to remain merely a desert. So if we think through this and we use this as a way of conceptualizing the activity of philosophy, we would see philosophy quite differently, I suspect, than we would uh, if we were looking at it in a strictly academic sense, whatever the fads of the time happen to be. And we see that philosophy bears a deep kinship with art, with love, with friendship, as an activity of the human being. 